Most of the capital cities of Australia are building in a business as usual way that is leading to poorer cities. Whenever they need to increase their population, they'll go to the fringe. What would happen if we stopped expanding and came back in on ourselves? And in 2010, we did that study. It was called Transforming Australian Cities. And it looked at, as Melbourne moved from 5 million to 10 million, if you put the next 5 million people within the boundary that existed of that day, what did that city look like? What it showed is if you put that population in and around the existing infrastructure, around the railway stations that form activity centres, small villages around our city, or if you put it along the public transport corridors, the road-based, you know, the, the trams and the rapid buses, and in your brown and greyfield sites, you could get 5 million people on 7.5% of the land by not building higher than 5 to 8 storeys. The most phenomenal thing was, when you looked at the cost of the infrastructure saved by doing that, for every million people you put into the city, you would save $110 billion in infrastructure costs over 50 years. So $550 billion, what could you do with that if you reinvest it in things that aren't roads or expansions to the city? We sit in a post-COVID city where we know now that we will mostly change the way we, we work. We won't all arrive at the office at 8 o'clock. In fact, some of us might not arrive at the office for uh, all five days of the week. So the city is going to change. The timing, the temporal use of the city is going to change. And in that, the opportunity exists to say, how do we now make this vision of a more intense Melbourne a reality? And what does that look like? The corridors around the tram network are a major part of that. And if you think about a simple analogy I've used throughout my urban design career, that if you design a good street, you design a good city. And we all judge that and find those streets very easily. What are the characteristics that you're looking for? And I think there are five. I think you need a density, and it doesn't have to be a high density, it can be a medium density, that adds energy to that particular area and adds a population not only to the area itself, but to the transport system that you're supporting. The other thing you need is mixed use. COVID has made us hyper-local. We've lived in Melbourne for the last seven months in our local neighbourhood. We've managed to survive with all that local environment. All of us, I think, would have come up with better ways of designing the local environment so we could access everything we needed. Mixed use gives us that accessibility close to home. The next thing which is intrinsic to what we're talking about is good connectivity. If the tram's running through it or the bus is running through or you're at a railway station, you've got good connectivity with the central city, which means the two will work together. But what about the walking environment? What about the cycling environment? That's where we need to look at the quality of those experiences. The next thing to actually achieve that quality environment is that public realm, that high quality public realm outside of the buildings. And that's not difficult. That's widening footpaths, planting trees, making sure there's activity from the retail or whatever's happening adjacent to the street spilling out of the street. And the way we want to do that gives us our fifth characteristic, which is local character. We don't want every place to look the same. I live in Fitzroy. Fitzroy has a particular character that came from a bohemian population that came through here 25 years ago. It still retains that characteristic and you want to build on that. You don't want to make it like central Melbourne or some other area. You want to make it Fitzroy. As we look at some of the areas that have changed over the last 10 years since we put this proposition forward, we'll investigate how some of those developments have achieved that or not achieved it and what do we need to assist in that process. This development is a good example of a small-scale development within a street. A small retail shop that has been converted into 14 units. It gives a density of about 200 people per hectare, which achieves that medium to high density that you want. But it sits in the street in such a way that you wouldn't notice it if we walked down the street 50 metres. So you've got the heritage character uninterrupted, and you've got density and you've got active frontage on it. 
This is a really good development. And one of the characteristics of the corridors is you don't have to have big sites. You can have small bespoke sites with smaller developers providing the variety that make up good streets. One of the characteristics we talked about was mixed use. Here we had an open lot car park. We now have social housing, a supermarket, some council offices, and out the back, childcare. This is all part of a high density area where the community have been re-engaged with the streets through this development. This is a really good example of mixed use working at its best. What we have here is a small scale good mixed use development. You can see it in combination with the heritage buildings and while it's starkly different, the combination of those three buildings makes the street interesting and tells the different periods of development. It also replaced a single storey retail development with a surface level car park. So it has added a population and intensity to this very exciting street in the centre of Melbourne. One of the benefits of intensification is the street life you get. And an important aspect of these developments is the high quality public realm. Here we are on Gertrude Street and across the road is one of the developments that we've shown you. It's producing a population that adds vitality to the street. That's both a sustainable outcome as well as a commercial outcome. To say nothing of the social benefits of people being able to use the public realm as the most democratic space of our city. So this is a good idea of how intensification should and could work. This is one of the larger scale developments. It's a frontage of over 100 metres. And what they've done is they've actually limited to about six floors, setting back the upper floors. And they've got a variety within the upper streetscape. So it looks like not one hand designing this, but a number of different developments. That variety didn't carry through to the ground floor where the shop front of Coles dominates and could have been better articulated. But a good example of how big sites could be made to look is though they are a combination of those smaller sites. If we're going to accommodate an extra 5 million people in a city like Melbourne, you're going to need to go to reasonable densities. Here we have an eight-storey building sitting within the street, but to mitigate that height, it's set back from the street. And this allows the street to still gain the sun and the scale of the traditional street while putting significant density on the site. I believe we should be looking at making development in and around our infrastructure as of right and putting in place a very simple planning scheme that brings out the five characteristics that we've talked about. We want to retain the heritage, we want to build in and around the infrastructure, we want to provide a high quality public realm where the activation comes from the buildings that surround those public spaces. We want it to be of that area, that local character, and we want it to be well connected. We need to rebuild in a post-COVID environment in a sustainable way. We know climate change is the single biggest challenge we face. COVID is a passing nine months, 12 months that we will get past as we have with other catastrophes in, in, in history. But climate change is the most imminent one and COVID and rebuilding gives us the opportunity to do it in a green way. And I think that is one of the most exciting things that we experience at the moment.